Good morning, everybody. Yeah, there we go. Welcome to Introduction to Blockchain. My name is Mark Krasinovich. I'm CTO of Microsoft Azure. Just to get an idea of what kind of audience we have here, how many of you came to this session because you want to get rich? <laughs> All right, just a few of you uh, raised your hands. That's good. So what I've got for you this morning is an overview of blockchain. And you can see here the agenda, which starts out by talking about Bitcoin. And there's a reason for that. Blockchain's got its origins in the origins of Bitcoin. So I'll talk a little bit about Bitcoin, the Bitcoin, Bitcoin cryptocurrency phenomenon, why Bitcoin got so popular and other cryptocurrencies have gotten popular. Then I'll talk about the foundation for Bitcoin, which is blockchain. Talk about the blockchain basics, go over some basic cryptography, which is at the foundation of blockchain. Then I'll talk about smart contracts, which is the evolution of blockchain to store business processes on the blockchain itself. I'll talk about consortium blockchains, which are organizations that form a blockchain network and then perform transactions using smart contracts on the blockchain. And then finally, I'll just wrap up with a quick look at some of the consensus variations, because we're going to spend a lot of our time in this session looking at the consensus algorithms that Bitcoin is built off of and other cryptocurrencies and public blockchain networks. But there are other ones that you should be aware of. So with that, let's go ahead and get started. This is a headline from January of 2018, so about a little over a year and a half ago. And it seemed like everybody was talking about Bitcoin. And you were probably talking about Bitcoin, your family members were talking about Bitcoin, and you heard all these stories about people like this that were just getting rich. And you might have been uttering that four-letter F word just like I was at the time, which is FOMO, fear of missing out. Everybody else was getting rich. There were friends of mine who had kids dropping out of college because they said that they'd become super experts at uh, cryptocurrency investing. And the fact is that everybody was an expert at cryptocurrency investing because cryptocurrency was so hyped up back then. In fact, companies like this, a uh, company called uh, Bioptics in the UK, changed its name to Riot Blockchain and its shares went up the next day. It's a publicly traded company by four, almost 400%. And then you might have heard of the company Long Island Iced Tea. You might have drank one of these. They renamed themselves to Long Blockchain. <laughs> and, and their uh, price of their stock went up 200%. So I just want to let it be known that from here on out, I'll be known as Mark Blockchain Racinovich. <laughs> Now, not everybody has been so enthusiastic about blockchain. Warren Buffett is famous for bashing cryptocurrencies and Bitcoin, and specifically, this is an article from uh, about a year ago, but he just made another comment bashing Bitcoin just a few days ago. But this one I found pretty interesting. Bitcoin is probably rat poison squared. And the ironic thing about this is that the next day, uh, cryptocurrency uh, rat coin actually doubled in price. Um, so it had a kind of a negative effect. But this is the chart of Bitcoin prices you can see. And you can see over there, April 2018, the 2018 crossover into 2019, that's when we started to see these spikes where Bitcoin was up in the over $20,000 a Bitcoin price range. You can see it's come down since then. And so there's a lot of people that were cryptocurrency experts that are now back in college. Um, and there's also some other uh, interesting examples of, uh, came across this tweet. When you see a Lambo delivering pizza is probably trying to make those, the lease payments after his Bitcoin losses in Miami. Yep. And uh, you can see there's a Lambo. <laughs> all right, so where did Bitcoin come from? This is uh, the paper that kicked it all off, blockchain and Bitcoin by Satoshi Nakamoto. It's a relatively short paper. It's concise to the point, describes the basics of blockchain and Bitcoin built on top of blockchain. I highly recommend you go read it. After this session, I'm gonna actually go through some of what's in the paper, so it provides a, a great foundation for presenting like this and telling people how blockchain works. Now, the interesting thing here is you can see Satoshi Nakamoto, there's the author, but nobody knows who the real Satoshi Nakamoto is. In fact. 
There's speculation that there is a, somebody really named Satoshi Nakamoto out there that has somehow remained anonymous. There's speculation that it's actually somebody that used this as a pseudonym. There's speculation that it was actually an organization that put this up as, as the front. Nobody really knows. And the interesting thing is that Satoshi, under the Satoshi smart uh, Bitcoin address, minting those initial Bitcoin tokens, whoever this is, would be worth billions of dollars today. Uh, there have been some speculation sightings of Satoshi, like th this one here. People <laughs> believe in Texas there's Satoshi driving around, and it's a fairly nice car, but everybody thought that this was really the find until somebody came across this one. And then now there's a lot of confusion. And this Satoshi, uh, you know, of course, you're not going to be driving around in your Kia Optima unless your Prius is in the shop after founding a multi billion dollar uh, cryptocurrency. But so, so nobody knows where uh, the Sato real Satoshi is to this date. Now, let's talk about cryptocurrency versus the alternative, which is called fiat currency. Fiat currency is what we pay for things generally today. It's issued by governments. There's delays between transaction and settlement. So when you cash a check or when you transfer some money to somebody, there's a delay as that is being processed between the two institutions or the two parties. There's a need for intermediaries generally for large transactions to prevent fraud and loss. So somebody will sit in between two parties and then broker the transaction and then they're the ones that will be um, ensuring the transaction in case something goes wrong on either side. And so that adds some fees to the transaction, that adds some delays to the transaction. And so cryptocurrency tries to address these challenges. One is that there's no central authority. So with cryptocurrency, there's no government issuing it. The network itself is issuing cryptocurrency. And I'll talk about how Bitcoin issues its cryptocurrency. So there's no mint that can just start producing this stuff like crazy. There's no government that can take control of this and try to force the, v the value up or down one way or another. There's no clearing. So when you perform a transaction giving somebody cryptocurrency, it's effectively instantaneous at the time that transaction's re uh, seen and recognized by the network, your cryptocurrency is now transferred into somebody else's account. So there's no intermediaries. You're doing it right on the, crypt on the blockchain itself. And there's an immutable transaction history. So you can look back at the entire record of all the transactions and see your transactions from way long in the past. The cryptographic properties of blockchain, like I'll show you, prevent somebody from going and tampering with any of those transactions without everybody seeing that they've been tampered with. And so this is one of the strong security characteristics of cryptocurrency. Like I said, cryptocurrency is built on top of blockchain. Uh, blockchains, you might hear somebody talk about blockchains and they'll reference it as distributed ledger technology. The reason that they call it distributed ledger technology is because if you think about what the blockchain and a cryptocurrency is keeping track of, it's a ledger of accounts and balances and transfers. And it's distributed because the, the network distributes the ledger across all the parties. In the case of a public network, everybody gets to see the ledger. The blockchains get their properties from cryptocurrency, and some of the properties, like we've covered, secure and immutable. It's shared, it's decentralized, and distributed, and it's a ledger. So let's go over some of the cryptographic basics. And I'll start with hashing, then I'll talk a little bit about public key cryptog cryptography, which is the, the root of how you authorize transactions, uh, transferring somebody your cryptocurrency to somebody else, and then talk about digital signatures and the use of that public key cryptography to do that. So let's start with cryptographic hashes. And cryptographic hashes are a succinct representation of a larger body of data. It's also called a digest, because you can think of it as a digest form of the longer story. And I'm going to just use an analogy here, the movie Star Wars. If you take and summarize it or pr produce a digest of it, you might look something like this. Now, there's no other movie in the world where if you s summarize it, will have exactly this digest. And that's one of the key properties of uh, 
secure hashing algorithm is that it has very, very low probability of any collisions, meaning you can take any body of data and you'll never get the exact same digest or hash from them. So a hash then can very uniquely represent a larger body of data. Given a hash, I know exactly where it came from. I can prove that it came from a certain body of data, and no other body of data will produce that same hash. Um, by the way, while we're on the topic of Star Wars, I wasn't at Microsoft at the time. It was known as the evil empire, but I'm at Microsoft now. And I, when I look back at this history, I can say that really uh, the empire was not trying to do anything wrong. It was simply trying to restore order to the universe. <laughs> and uh, the, by the way, the exhaust port will be fixed on Patch Tuesday coming up. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about cryptographic hash functions in some more detail. So like I said, take in any piece of text, run it through a cryptographic hash function. The one that people use today is SHA-2 or SHA-256, it's also known as. You can see lots of different variations produce slightly different digests. The digests are fixed size. So you can see here the digest is a fixed number of bytes in length. So no matter how long the text you're going to hash, you get the same fixed length digest, which is a very convenient aspect of the cryptographic hash algorithm. So that's hashing. Now let's talk about encryption. And I'm going to talk about symmetric encryption because that'll lead us into asymmetric encryption, which is built on public key cryptography, which is at the root of signing, which is at the root of securing blo uh, blockchain transactions. So with symmetric encryption, you're probably familiar with this. You take an unencrypted message, you've got a key. You take that key, this could be AES-256, for example, which is a very popular symmetric encryption algorithm. You take that key, you encrypt the data. Now the data is encrypted. You can take that same key and then decrypt it. So it's symmetric because you use the same key both to decrypt or encrypt and decrypt. Now public key cryptography, it's also known as asymmetric key cryptography, is a little bit different. And I'm going to use an analogy here of a lock. This lock has one unlock position here in the center, and it has two lock positions. And there's two keys that you can insert in the lock. One of those keys is the public key. In the public key, you can only turn, for example, this lock counterclockwise. When you turn it counterclockwise from the unlock position, it locks with the public key. Now, the private key, that when you insert it, you can turn it only clockwise. So if the lock is locked with the public key, you can take the private key and unlock it and, move it, or, and then move it all the way to the lock position if you want. So these are the two keys, asymmetric. One turns one way, one turns the other way. And this use of keys and these two positions on the lock allow you to do two different kinds of things with these keys. One of these is encrypting data. So if we take for example, this piece of text, and you want to encrypt the data so that nobody except somebody that you want to see it sees it, what you can do is take the public key and encrypt the data. And now only the person with that private key that corresponds to that public key can unlock it and, and get the decrypted form of the data. And that's why one is called the private key and one's called the public key. The private key is what the owner of the, this lock position on the right side has. And if they want people to be able to send them encrypted data, they can hand out their public key. And it's public because they can hand out that to anybody. That public key can only be used to encrypt data and to give to the person with the private key. Once it's encrypted with the public key, nobody with the public key can decrypt it, because remember, it only turns in one direction only the person with the private key can decrypt the data. So if you have a sender that wants to send to a receiver, takes their pub receiver's public key, passes it through the encryption algorithm, now that's an encrypted message that only that receiver with that private key can decrypt by turning the lock in the right direction and then un unlocking it to get the data out of it. So that's one way that you can use public key cryptography. Now this isn't the way that it's used in blockchains. The way it's used in blockchains is in the reverse direction. And this is something called signing. Here, you want to prove to somebody else that you have seen a block of data and 
you're giving it to somebody and they can verify that you have actually, for that block of data, seen it and made some statement about it. That statement could be, hey, I'm authorizing this transaction. It could be, I'm authorizing that this is a valid file, for example. It can be for anything where the proof is that you actually saw that block of data and you used your private key to make a statement about that data. So the way it works this in this direction is you take your private key, now you encrypt the data, and now anybody with the public key can decrypt it. And they know if they can decrypt it that you encrypted it with the private key because that's the only way the lock will unlock. And this is digital signing. So looking at this flow, again, we take the message. Now, when you talk about digital signing, you don't really take and encrypt the whole contents of the body. This is where hashing comes back into play. Instead of encrypting the whole block of data, you just encrypt the digest of the data. And the digest, like we said, uniquely represents that whole block of data. So there's no reason to encrypt the whole thing if we can just encrypt the small representation. So you take that message, you create a hash of it. Now you take the private key, you encrypt that hash. Now anybody with the public key can decrypt what you've encrypted so they can get back the clear text hash. And now they can themselves go and hash that block of data and get a hash from it. And if that hash matches the hash they decrypted from you, then that proves that you hash that block of data and whatever statement you're making about it is true. Like, I'm authorizing this transaction with my private key because I'm authorized to do that. Or I'm signing this document and it's proof that I actually signed this document with this text. So that's digital signing. And if it doesn't, the hashes don't match, obviously there's an error of some kind. Could mean that somebody's trying to trick you into thinking that somebody signed the document when they actually didn't sign it. So kind of a cool property of asymmetric cryptography, you can use it in both directions. One for encryption, we're encrypting data for a particular person, the other one for signing, where the person with the private key is actually making a statement. So let's talk a little bit about blockchain transactions now that we've got that behind us. Here the scenario is that Bob wants to pay Alice some Bitcoin. Now the way that Bob shows that he can pay Alice some Bitcoin is by referencing the output of a previous transaction that gave Bob at least that amount of Bitcoin. In this case, at least 10 Bitcoin. And he takes Alice's public key which is the way he says this is for Alice, and then he digitally signs that bot package right there. The package is pay Alice 10 Bitcoin, here's the reference to the previous transaction that put money in 10 Bitcoin in my account, Bob's account, as represented by Bob's public key, private key pair, and then Bob signs that, giving ownership to Alice of that 10 Bitcoin. Now, anybody that wants to verify that this is a valid transaction just has to take that signed hash of that transaction body and decrypt it with Bob's public key. And if it decrypts and matches the hash, that means Bob really did authorize that transaction of giving 10 Bitcoin to Alice. So now you can build up transaction chains because you're referencing previous transactions to give the cryptocurrency to the next person in line, the next person you want to pay. And so that way the Bitcoin is changing ownership through this transaction chain. In this case, right here, we've got one transaction that owner zero, the person that originally owned this Bitcoin, is giving that Bitcoin to owner one. And just like this could be Bob giving Alice that Bitcoin, that is Alice's Bob public key there, owner one. Owner one signs that, uh, oh, so owner one now, Alice, has that transaction as a reference and then can hand it off to somebody else by signing a transaction that, that gives it to owner two in this case. And then that can be verified as a valid transaction, referencing back to the previous transaction, and you get the idea. Now owner two can then go and hand that Bitcoin to somebody else, owner three, by going and digitally signing a transaction that hands it to owner three. And thus you get this chain of transactions. So let's go take a look at an example transaction on the Bitcoin network. So here, 
I'm on a, a Bitcoin uh, explorer called blockchain.com. This actually can explore multiple public ledgers or blockchains. I've happened to pick out one transaction for us to focus on. And let's break down what we're seeing here. First of all, this right here is the address of a cryptocurrency account. And you can see that it, this cryptocurrency account is 1NX. This is the textual representation of that cryptocurrency account, the hash of the public key of that account. And then this tra specific transaction takes the output of the previous transaction and splits it into three outputs. And those three outputs are represented by different accounts. You can see that one of the outputs is the same account. So it's basically giving Bitcoin back to the same account. And the reason that you see this is because you can't actually break Bitcoin apart. You can't say, I'm going to pay a fraction of this previous Bitcoin transaction and leave the other part unspent. You've got to take the whole output of the transaction, and then you can split it up into different outputs. And the way that you split it by saying, hey, I've got a transaction that is 20 Bitcoin to me, but I want to give 10 to Alice, is I do a transaction, give 10 to Alice in one output, and I give 10 back to myself as the other output. And so that's what you're seeing here. In this case, it looks like they wanted to pay two parties here, one 3.7 Bitcoin, 1.17, and then the rest of the previous transaction they pay back to themselves. So you can see the total input and total output. Now the interesting thing is that you can see that there's a difference actually, very small, between the total input and total output. And I'll come back and talk about what that represents here in a few minutes. But some of the other information you can see, included in block, number of confirmations, I'll talk about what that is, uh, the fee and scripts. scripts are here because actually underneath Bitcoin, there's a simple scripting language. And that simple scripting language is used to actually do some logic on transactions and what, is, what makes a transaction val valid. So basically, the, KIP, uh, the Bitcoin virtual machine executes that script. And then if the conditions to unlock a transaction are valid, then it'll unlock the transaction. So that's a quick look at transactions. Now let's talk about the problem of consensus, because what we're talking about here is a, a public blockchain. Everybody in the world can see it. Everybody in the world can submit transactions. You can submit a transaction to the, block, the Bitcoin network. The question is, how does the network decide which transactions are valid? And this is in what order they are in as well is really important. Because the order means the difference between having money in account to make the, the transaction and not having the money in the account to make the transaction. For example, if I have an, a, a transaction where I'm giving, I've got a million Bitcoin in my account, and I give 800,000 of that Bitcoin to somebody, and then I give 200,000 of that Bitcoin, or uh, 400,000, I try to do a transaction with 400,000, which is more than what I had, depending on the order, one of those transactions will succeed and the other one will fail. And you don't want to be on the receiving side of a failed transaction that you actually thought was legitimate. So what the network is going to try to prevent is you from giving one transaction to somebody and saying, hey, I'm giving you 800,000 Bitcoin, turning around and giving 400,000 Bitcoin to somebody else, and then that person getting your Bitcoin and the other person being out that 800,000 and, and whatever they gave you in exchange. Again, the order matters. And so somebody can try to double spend their cryptocurrency by hopefully getting those two parties to not realize that you don't really have a total of 1.2 million in your account. And they both give you what you're paying for. And you basically double spent your million cryptocurrency. So how do we, the network prevent that? Well, there's a big problem when it comes to these public blockchains. And that's nobody trusts anybody else. It's kind of like Thanksgiving in my house. Uh, so everybody, you know, is generally trustworthy, but there's actors out there that really want to try to double spend. And so how does the network prevent those bad actors from getting away with double spending? And the answer is to accept proposals for transactions from anywhere, then have some way that somebody can verify that and propose a transaction order, and then the network will agree 
that that's the order of transactions. There, different blockchains have slightly different mechanisms for this consensus, and I'll talk about some of the variations, like I said at the very end, but let's talk about the Bitcoin one, which is really the foundation and really what many other blockchains and cryptocurrencies have their consensus algorithms modeled on. The process of submitting a trans set of transactions in the order is called mining. And there's anybody that submits a valid block of transactions to the network is called a miner. And anybody can be a miner. Anybody can organize a bunch of transactions, produce a block. If those transactions are legitimate, submit them to the network. And then the network might decide, hey, that block is the one that we're all going to decide on is the next block of transactions. And that's winning the block or successfully mining the blockchain. Now, these blocks reference each other, so it's a linear list, and hence the name blockchain is, comes from this. Not the transaction chains we saw earlier, but the fact that the blocks themselves of transactions are linked in this list here, where you can see that they're strongly linked together through the hashes, because the hash of block, four, five, or block 4562 includes the hash of the previous block. And that way you can cryptographically prove this is the next block in that chain. And if somebody goes and messes with the contents of block 4561, that will invalidate that hash in the next block, and everybody will see that that block has been tampered with. And so that's what I meant by it's effectively immutable because anybody can see if somebody screws around with the contents of a block or a transaction. So how do we accept how does Bitcoin accept proposals from miners? Well, it has them do some amount of work. And this amount of work is effectively, it does two things. First of all, it shows that the miners are invested in the blockchain, that they actually have to do a bunch of work to produce a, a block. And the second is that it slows down the rate that blocks are being proposed such that the network can converge on a, a valid or agreed upon set of blocks. And the way that Bitcoin does it is to start with this hash problem. Here the problem here is find a hash that starts with four zeros of hello world plus a nonce. What that nonce does is make it possible to actually solve that puzzle. Because if I just said, hey, go find a hash of hello world that starts with four zeros, using a specific hash algorithm, that's impossible because you hash it and it will have a certain hash value. You hash it again, it will have the same hash value. So the only, only way to modify the output of the hash value is to, to tweak it a bit. And the nonce lets the miner tweak the hash of a block. It does it by letting them just play around with numbers until they happen to come up with one when added to that text, hello world, or the, actually in the, the case of mining, to the contents of the block, such that it solves the problem. And you can imagine, just looking at this, that the more zeros you ask the miner to shoot for when it hashes, the harder the problem is. And so this is called mining difficulty. And the mining difficulty in Bitcoin is set to uh, roughly generate a block every 10 minutes. So there's a, a certain amount of miners out there. Their total hash power is basically determined by how fast a block is mined by one of the miners. And the more miners you've got, the more likely you're going to solve the puzzle within a shorter period of time, so at a certain difficulty. So for example, if I've got 1,000 miners and it takes on average 10 minutes for them to solve this puzzle, that's what Bitcoin's shooting for, 10 minutes per block. Now, if another 1,000 miners show up and they're mining, we'll probabilistically half that time, and they'll come up with a solution in five minutes. So what Bitcoin does at that point is it adjusts the difficulty to make it harder and try to bring it back to 10 minutes. So Bitcoin's target for mining is 10 minutes, and it does that by adjusting the difficulty. If there's 2,000 miners and 1,000 of them stop mining, the problem gets harder again, so it, and it takes longer, so what it'll do is have the, the, the mining puzzle difficulty. Now, the fact is that with Bitcoin, it's just been getting more and more difficult because more and more miners show up to try to win the blockchain prize. 
So even with this consensus algorithm, though, you can end up with something called forks. So forks occur when miners validly mine a block that can be the next block in the chain at approximately the same time. Because this is a distributed network, tens of thousands of nodes out there all looking and listening for blocks to be distributed around the network. And you, you use a uh, node here on the network, might get two blocks within seconds of each other that are valid. They're valid transactions, no double spends, they're correctly represented and formatted, they reference the previous block, everything looks good, there's two of them. And that's perfectly legitimate scenario, and that happens all the time. The way that this is addressed is that the nodes basically say, okay, so there's two possibilities here. I'm not sure which fork in this tree is gonna end up being the right one. What eventually happens is that one of the branches will get longer, just statistically. Some, because some of the miners will mine off one branch and some of the miners will mine off the other branch. And the, the branch that the most hash power chooses is the one that's most likely to start generating a block before the other ones. And so one block will get, one chain will get longer and at that point the network says, oh, that chain is the one that's valid. So it discards the other chain. It's still theoretically possible though that even after there's been a one fork that's longer than the other and the network says that's the one, that statistically speaking, the mine, some miners are off on the other fork still and they produce the next block here before this branch does. And so suddenly a node on the network gets three blocks off that branch that it discarded when there's only two on the main branch. And at that point it says, oh, that branch is longer, discard these two blocks right there. So that's an interesting dilemma for people that are transacting on Bitcoin because it means that there's no 100% guarantee that a block will be immutable, meaning it can't be forked off and defeated by another longer chain. Now it becomes incredibly hard to do the double spend attack, which is what we're trying to prevent here, of somebody going back into history and trying to mine a fork that doesn't spend their cryptocurrency faster than the rest of the network miners are trying to create blocks off the main branch. But that is possible. So the rule of thumb when it comes to Bitcoin transactions for how long you should wait for a high value transaction to consider it really solidified in the tree is to consider the depth of the block in the tree the number of confirmations the block has by the rest of the network. In Bitcoin, it's generally suggested that you wait for six confirmations, roughly an hour, because that's six blocks, six times 10 minutes is an hour. And so you wait for 60 minutes, and then at that point, it's extremely improbable, extremely, extremely low probability that that block that has the transaction you're looking at that's six deep in this tr tree right here, will get undone by another fork winning. So what is the incentive now for miners to do all this work and to be producing blocks and all this work that takes 10 minutes of hashing, huge amounts of computational power at hashing? There's gotta be some reward. That reward is called Coinbase. Whoever mines the block gets newly minted coin. And this is the way that Bitcoin generates it's currency. It doesn't do it with, like I said, a government issuing it. It does it by the algorithm saying, if you mine a block, you get some amount of Bitcoin transferred to whatever account you want, which is generally your own account. If you take a look at Bitcoin, the algorithm that Satoshi chose for this reward halves every 210,000 blocks. And it started at 50 Bitcoin. So the first blocks, which Satoshi mined himself or herself or itself generated 50 bitcoins per block and that's why Satoshi mined a few thousand blocks before it, Satoshi opened it up to the public and that's where our, all those tens of billions of dollars for Satoshi's account came from. This is roughly every three to four years of having though and we've currently gone from 50 to 25 to 12.5 
And I'll show you in a second the estimated date of the next great halving. But you can see here the generated Bitcoin money supply will run out. There will be no more coins mined as part of Coinbase because of this halving roughly in the mid-2030s. So what happens to my mining at that point? Well, there's already something in play, and it's not purely true to say that Bitcoin has no transaction fees, because miners also appreciate getting a tip. And that tip is a mining, con considered a mining fee. Remember we looked at that transaction and there was some part of it that was unspent, a very small amount? That's considered the tip for the miner. And the miner gets that as part of mining the block on top of the coin base. And the idea is as the coin base decays, there'll be more and more fees because the network is getting bigger and bigger. And so just fractional fees are enough to support the miners. Now, in a purely greedy world, the miners would just mine the transactions that have big fees on them. And it's true that you can generally get your transaction processed faster by the network by putting a bigger fee into your or unspent coin into your transaction. But the miners are supposed to be somewhat uh, altruistic and then have this pool of transactions that even might not have any fees and mine those. So the network tries to, to be fair. But those fees do, do accelerate the processing time for your transactions. So let's take a look at blocks now that we've got that foundation. So if I switch back, now this particular transaction, first of all, you can see that this fee is 0 .001 in this, and that's the unspent difference between the total inputs and the total outputs. So this is the, the tip that this, this uh, particular account decided to give to the miner for processing their transaction. Now this transaction I pulled out of this block here. And you can see this, or this, uh, this block right here. And this is as of about an hour ago, the Bitcoin transaction tree. This is the top of the, the block chain. So this would be the representing the top block in that picture that I showed you before. The one I looked at is right here. So it's one, two, three, four, five, six, roughly six or seven blocks deep. And so this one is one that you can count. You can see it was relayed by ant pool, and I'm going to talk about what ant pool is in a second. And then you can see the hash of the block. And we can click on that block, and we can see all the information. The number of transactions in the block, so roughly 2,346. The total amount of uh, Bitcoin outputted in transactions, so you can see 6,600 Bitcoin outputs. Estimated transaction volume, transaction fees. So this is the fees that the miner got, about three quarters of a Bitcoin on top of their 12.5 that they got for the coin, from the Coinbase. And then relayed by somebody that volunteered who they were. And then you can see the transactions. And we, like I said, we were looking at one of the specific of these transactions here in this list. So those are all the transactions. So that's a quick look at blockchain. Now, Here's the countdown timer. It's 381 days, so just over a year until Bitcoin halves again to 6.25. You can see on this kind of tracker too the total number of Bitcoin in circulation. The total number of Bitcoin that will ever be produced through Coinbase is 21 million. So Bitcoin is also called a deflationary currency because of the fact that the currency basically runs out. And it's not like inflationary like fiat currency where the government can start printing more if they want more money. Okay, so let's come back. Now that we've got a, the foundations of blockchain, mining, let's talk about what that ant pool was. And that came from something called a mining pool. If you go try, if you go home and you can run your own miner. You can set it up and try to hash blocks, transactions you get from the network and create a block and hopefully win that 12.5, which 12.5 times roughly $5,000 is a decent chunk of change for, doing a, for mining a block on the Bitcoin network. But your chance of doing it is extremely low because there's so much hash power out there. And what has been happening since the very start is that groups of people get together and they say, hey, let's pool our resources 
let's, all buy, let's go buy a bunch of, of hashing systems, GPUs or other computers to go and hash. And if um, together we end up mining a block, then we each get a fraction of that coin base and fees based on how much we've contributed to the mining pool. So here's an example of a mining pool set up in China. Actually, this is my basement. No. Uh, no, it's not my basement. I would never let you know this rat's nest of cables uh, sit right here. Here's my basement. This is uh, no, but this is another mining pool. Um, that you, so these mining pools have gotten enormous. And just to show you that where, how hash power is distributed and how how much power is used, here's some charts for you. I'm showing you this chart. This is from February, the last time I snapshotted this. Energy consumption by country, and this is treating Bitcoin hashing the amount of electricity spent on hashing as if it was a country. And you can see it sits right there between Singapore and Portugal, number 52 in the world in energy consumption. That was February. This is as of yesterday, number 44 it's moved up to between Kuwait and Colombia. So the amount of energy that hashers are spending trying to win those mining rewards continues to increase. Now where's all this hashing happening? So you can see ant pool in this diagram. Ant pool is there in the green. That is the mining pool that, that contributed that block we were looking at. It said, hey, this block, it's us, ant pool. And the reason that they advertise is you look at the, who's mining the blocks and you go, oh, that's the mining pool that is winning all these blocks. I want to be part of that. I'm going to go contribute money to that mining pool and get a share of those winning blocks. But you can see that there's a number of larger mining pools that have been winning blocks. This is as of uh, just yesterday. And this is where they're from. <laughs> so China, the amount of hash power, it's, it's something like 70, 80% of the amount of Bitcoin hash power is in, based in China, which is ironic given that the Chinese government has outlawed cryptocurrency. Um, and they've actually told the miners of a year ago, they said, hey, you need to shut down and make an orderly exit. But so far, as you can see, there's been no sign of any such exit uh, from mining in China. And I have a feeling, you know, they're like, whatever, if you shut us down here, we're just going to move offshore and mine over there. So it's not a big deal. Now, we're, oh, by the way, that slash pool, you can see there's a block that's unknown. That's nobody that's, uh, the blocks that are being submitted without any attribution. But slush pool, that happens to be in Czech Republic. So way to go, Czech, Czech Republic. Yay. Anybody here from Czech Republic? No? All right. Anybody want to form a mining pool with me, by the way? <laughs> uh, all right. So... I talked about 51% attacks, and they're not just theoretical. They've actually happened. This taking a fork and invalidating it by throwing enough hash power to force another, the network to accept another fork that's longer, which it has to do just algorithmically. This fork is longer, so I'm going to take it. The network's going to agree to it and discard that other one. And Bitcoin Gold, this is, you can see, May of last year, got hit by multiple double spend attacks. These double spend attacks were taking transactions that were aimed at uh, exchanges. So basically, uh, cryptocurrency exchanges where they would transfer Bitcoin gold to these cryptocurrency exchanges. Bitcoin gold is one of the forks off of the original Bitcoin. And then they would turn around and they had more than 50% of the hash power in the Bitcoin ne gold network. So they would hash another branch that would invalidate that block and then go spend that transaction that, again with another exchange and exchange it for maybe some other cryptocurrency. So now they've basically eight double spend attacks totaling $17.5 million before they were finally stopped, uh, stopped doing these double spend attacks. Ethereum Classic, also just earlier this year, in January, got hit by double spend attack as well. Uh, $1.5 million lost in that one. Ethereum Classic being a, a fork of the Ethereum network, which I'll talk about in a minute. And then there's other ways that you can lose money in Bitcoin besides a double spend attack. Like this one. This is a Bitcoin dealer in Canada. Fascinating thing about this. This is a Bitcoin exchange, had hundreds of millions of dollars of Bitcoin. The founder of that had the master key for the exchange on their laptop. And the founder died in February or January. And nobody knew the password to the founder's laptop. So the, pat, the key was lost. So this was, uh, you can see, $250 million lost just because that 
founder died without having a backup of the key that anybody else could access. You can see the company filed for bankruptcy protection and, and lots of exchanges very upset and customers very upset by that. But that's another way to lose it and that shows the importance of your private key because that private key represents that amount of money you've got. In fact, it's estimated that about 20% of all of Bitcoin that's been minted so far is lost because people have just lost the keys to them, to those, that, uh, those accounts. Now, there's people to try to steal in the more traditional ways, <laughs> which doesn't work so well given this is a cryptocurrency and there's no actually, nothing actually inside that machine. But um, I guess people haven't, some people haven't figured that out yet. So putting it all together, there's about 10,000 full Bitcoin nodes around the world. You can set up a node. You can sync the Bitcoin network onto your own laptop if you want. You can do your own mining if you'd like to. You can join a mining pool. You can buy Bitcoin. There's several uh, cryptocurrency exchanges, one called Coinbase that's very popular that will let you spend dollars and get cryptocurrency back in exchange and then manage it in their wallet so you've got their protection of your uh, crypto funds. So, and lots of ways to get started with Bitcoin. But I'm gonna turn our attention now to other coins that have been generated on top, and there's been hundreds of them. Some of the most popular ones, Litecoin, Ethereum, Ether, which I'm gonna talk about more in a minute, but you can see Ripple XRP is another one that's been popular. Wanna just highlight this one because it's not really a cryptocurrency. Even though it looks like one, it's tracked on blockchain. It's actually one where there's a company, Ripple, that can issue these at will. So they've got control over the algorithm. It's not like a distributed uh, consensus governed algorithm like Bitcoin or Ethereum. So a lot of people don't really consider that a true cryptocurrency, more like a fiat, crypto, uh, fiat currency. There's lots of scams last year. Uh, so companies were doing ICOs, initial coin offerings, to try to raise money. And about 80% of them last year, they were just like hundreds and hundreds of them. About 80% of them were scams, of course, companies saying, or people saying, hey, here's an ICO, come and buy my coin. It's gonna increase in value because more and more people are gonna want it. And then they just take the money and run. Um, there's a company that actually, one of them, that launched a cryptocurrency last year too. Uh, this one is near and dear to my, Pied Piper, how many people have heard of this company? So as I expected the build audience, quite a few of you have. This company, I'm proud to say, is a, a customer of Azure. This is a screenshot from a couple seasons ago. That's the Azure portal on the TV show. Because Pied Piper is actually a fictitious company on a show called Silicon Valley that's on HBO that spoofs uh, the Silicon Valley culture. But nevertheless, uh, they did get one thing right, and that is Azure is a great cloud that they use. Uh, <laughs> but I, I do want to share, um, let's see if I can get this to play. So this is um, Bertram Guilfoy, one of the characters, talking about why they did an ICO. And um, this kind of explains some of the philosophy, the purest philosophy behind cryptocurrency. And uh, <clears throat> hopefully this will play. Okay, no volume. Can we get volume on this? Decentralized internet company Pied Piper is the most recent Valley startup to ICO. And joining us to discuss, Chief Systems Architect Bertram Guilfoyle. Welcome, Bertram. It's Guilfoyle. Okay then, Guilfoyle. Tell me a little bit about your past experience with cryptocurrency. Well, I've been mining coins since 2009. It was a different scene then, underground only true believers. So I imagine when it came to launching Pied Piper coin that you were the team's head cheerleader. Let me rephrase that. <laughs> what attracted you personally to an ICO? What attracted me was the passage an ICO offers across the river sticks of venture capital. What attracted me was an informed disdain for traditional fiat currency, its paper, 
stained with the greasy fingerprints of your banks and your mints. What attracted me was cryptocurrency's fundamental anonymity that shields private transactions from the peering green eyes of the all-knowing governmental overlords. Does that answer your question? You have a rather bleak view of financial institutions that have worked for centuries. Worked? How so? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Bertram. It's Guilfoyle. Still to come, the aftermath of Hooli's manufacture. So, yeah, that captures it pretty well. Um, in Ethereum Classic, that's uh, one of the cryptocurrencies that, went, uh, that forked off of Ethereum. Uh, it was actually the original Ethereum, and Ethereum today, the main Ethereum, actually. Uh, did a fork a, a few years ago. Ethereum Classic was the original that said, we're not forking, we're staying with what we've got. And that uh, is the kind of culture represented by the people that back uh, Ethereum Classic. All right, let's talk about smart contracts now. Like I mentioned, bl blockchains aren't just for cryptocurrencies. They're also for executing business processes in the form of programs that actually run on this distributed blockchain. So the reason why people are interested in this is that now you've codified a business flow in code. And now that code can autonomously effectively execute. Given certain inputs at certain times, it, that workflow will just execute. Everybody can see the workflow. And it's immutable, it's deterministic, it gets these other properties of, of blockchain. So the code in the state of the smart contract, it's got its own key value store, is stored in the blockchain. It can transfer assets with off blockchain assets. It's immutable, like I said, deterministic. Now, one of the side effects of this to, to secure these smart contracts is that every node to validate transactions now that are on smart contracts actually have to go and execute that smart contract and say, OK, these inputs resulted in these outputs. Uh, the miner, whoever submitted a block with these outputs in it, or the, that's a valid, or reference these inputs, that's a valid transaction. So because these miners now have to execute the smart contracts, when you submit a transaction, you pay something called gas to have those miners execute your smart contract code. And that prevents a denial of service where they're just running off executing code like crazy. Basically, you're paying. If your transaction gets approved, you're, it's like a fee. You're paying for the execution of your smart contract on the blockchain network. There's two types of tokens. Um, when you talk about smart contracts, they work in tokens. You can think of cryptocurrency as a type of token. It's a fungible token. And what that means is that every Bitcoin looks like every other Bitcoin. You can transfer one Bitcoin to another Bitcoin, and nobody cares. But there's non-fungible tokens. Non-fungible tokens are, hey, this is a unique item, has a unique ID, and it's not transferable or the same as any other item, even if it's of the same type. And you can see some examples there. And we see smart contracts being deployed on blockchain networks of both types. One of them, one of the most famous smart contracts on the public Ethereum network. And Ethereum is a smart contract network created by Vitalik Buterin, who happens to be here at Build today and will be in my session later today, this afternoon. He created Ethereum as a platform for smart contracts one of the most popular public smart contracts is CryptoKitties, which is a, a non-fungible token representing a unique kitty. The idea is you pay for a kitten. And the smart contract has rules for taking two kittens and breeding, or two cats, and breeding them to produce a third cat. And so if you get a good cat with a desirable genes, it's worth more money, and you can sell it to other people. And you laugh, but a uh, record was set for the most expensive crypto kitty ever just uh, late last year. Somebody spent $170,000 for one of these crypto kitties. Um, even WikiLeaks accepts crypto kitties as, or sells crypto kitties. So WikiLeaks produces their own, buys their own crypto kitties, and then you sells them in their store. So if you want one of those, um, good luck. All right, so let's, talk, let's take, a, take a look at smart contracts now. And I've got two types of smart contracts I'm going to show you, and it should give you an idea for what smart contract development looks like. The smart contract I'm showing you here is what's called a token. 
And there's a, a standard, all those ICOs, well, you can do ICOs on top of Ethereum very easily. If you follow, if your smart contract has a uh, speci specific set of interfaces that comply to a standard, in this case, ERC-20 token type, then the network viewers understand how to track the token assets. And what I've got here is Mark's token. So it's, I'm issuing my own ICO. And this is the standard. You can go pull this down from anywhere. You can see balance and transfer functions, and that's basically it. This is a language called Solidity. And what I'm going to do is um, run the Solidity, one of the Solidity dev environments, Truffle, and I'm going to compile that contract and deploy it in the local test environment that's local on this laptop. And I'll do that by typing migrate, which basically says migrate that smart contract to the network. In this case, I didn't specify any target network, so it goes to the local network. You can do unit tests on your smart contracts. I'm just running the standard ERC-20 tests. They all pass. And now I've got a little script here, transfer, that calls into the, my smart contract and will take a certain amount of money from one account and transfer it to another account by calling methods. Here you can see transfer, checking the balance here, balance. And so this is just a, a workflow here of executing a transaction. And if I execute that, then you can see the recipient got that amount of money, transferring that amount of money to the recipient. The, Final, the owner had a huge amount of money in their account, so just a small amount transferred. And then what you can do with these Solidity smart contracts is you can deploy them on test networks. And here's the Robston Ethernet, or Ether, Ethereum test network called Robston. I've deployed Mark's token to it. You can see there's Mark's token. And then you can do test transactions and ex exercise your smart contracts. Here's a, a tool called MetaMask. It's a browser plugin that's aimed at doing uh, token transactions. And I'm going to send from one account and Mark's token to another account uh, just a fraction of Mark's token, because I, I don't want to give it all away. And then I want this to be fast. The more gas, or the, most, the more fees you spend, rather, the f again, the more likely it's going to be executed quickly by the network. Now, on the, on the test network, um, it's kind of whatever you want to do, so uh, really no fees are being spent. Everybody's kind of just participating in this just to support the network, and you're going to see this transaction get committed here in a second. Oh, there it's confirmed, so I'm refreshing the Ropston Explorer, this will show up here in a second. All right, the transaction was confirmed, so this small delay, there it goes, 54 seconds ago. And there's that transaction that I just submitted on that public test Ethereum network. So that's a quick look at smart contracts. Now, that was a very simple look, but the thing is, a lot of companies now are looking at encoding their processes on smart contracts. And the question is, why do you want to use blockchain to do this? Why don't you just use a centralized database? Some of the benefits of blockchain, which we've already talked about, are these. Censorship resistance, immutability, this distributed, resilient to failures. But there's alternatives. If you trust one party to operate the ledger or database, just do that. That's called SQL Server, and it's worked great for enterprises for a long time. <laughs> and it's not, blockchain isn't some magic dust. It's not like, what's the question? The answer is blockchain. The question is, do you have something where you want these benefits that you're not going to get out of a centralized database? And that's why you might want to use blockchain. There's two categories of blockchain applications. There's workflows, and then there's exchanges. The exchanges are ones like we've talked, looked at, like. Mark's token is an exchange application, but workflow applications are ones that execute some business process that's not really transferring an asset. And you can see across all these different verticals, all the different places that we've seen these types of verticals look at using blockchain to make their business processes more efficient and get those benefits that we saw from blockchain. I'm going to just cover some of, the quick, uh, some of them very quickly. 
to point out that, in general, those kinds of business processes aren't executed on public blockchains. They're done on private or consortium blockchains. And the consortiums are groups of organizations that want to transact with one another or perform some workflow between each other. We've de uh, worked with Bank of America to create one to simplify a process that you can see here, the old way of all the steps to get a trans uh, standby letter of credit for a partner of Microsoft that will then get a loan from Bank of America. And you can see just tons of different steps, lots of delays, lots of ch chance for error. Here's what it looks like on blockchain with a smart contract, simplifying it. Now, no delays, no intermediaries, deterministic execution. Here's another example. This is Maersk, which has worked with Guard Time and Ernst and & Young and us to provide insurance for their ships. And you can see the ideal path of a ship is to go completely through the safe zone, but you can see the route might take it through a danger zone. You've got a smart contract that gets created at the time the ship departs, and then you've got methods on that smart contract that trigger when it enters the dangerous zone to raise the insurance rate and then decrease them afterwards. We're also using it for Xbox with Electronic Arts to track royalty payments and uh, performance of games. This is also simplifying the, those payment processes to those media publishers and the artists that have traditionally taken months. Now they can see exactly what's going on by looking at the blockchain. And then finally, uh, another one, Moog, is a supply chain company. You can see they're working with the military to do supply chain for parts, where you put a design schematic on the blockchain, you get a unique QR code that represents that part out on the ship. When that sh part looks like it's going to fail, then you can use that uh, schematic to produce a 3D print of model of that part right there on the ship and replace the one that you've got that's failing. And all that's done securely and immutably. Now there's other examples of smart contract ledgers. Quorum, that's the first one that we've integrated with our Azure blockchain service, but there's others, Hyperledger Fabric and R3 Corda. These three, plus, Ether uh, plus Ethereum, and Quor Quorum is based off Ethereum and so is Hyperledger Fabric, are really the most popular enterprise blockchain ledger types or distributed ledgers. Now, one last thing, just consensus variations. We've been talking about proof of work, which has very low performance. You can see every 10 minutes it takes. On the other side, you have fault tolerant consensus. That's what you would have with SQL always on availability groups, which does basically transactions extremely quickly. And that it, it's because it trusts itself and the operator of the SQL database. But then there's variations in between. And Byzantine, pra uh, practical Byzantine fault tolerance, proof of stake, and proof of authority. You're seeing a lot of proof of authority now in enterprises. Proof of authority being these are the entities or, that are part of the consortium that are trusted to validate blocks of transactions. And so now it can be extremely quick. There's no distributed proof of work. There's no waste of energy. And so that can be more quick. Now, the, you can see the trade-off here, more trust versus lower performance on this scale. And what we're seeing is enterprises trying to get over to the more trust and actually in a consortium where they trust each other because they're actually doing business with each other. It's not like random people out in the open web there can be more trust and they can resort to these more trustworthy or trust-based consensus variations. All right, so that's a quick overview of Bitcoin, crypto cryptocurrencies built on a foundation of blockchain, quick look at smart contracts and the use of blockchain in enterprise scenarios. I hope this kind of demystified some things for you and you got an idea for the cryptography that underlies what blockchain is. Uh, remember, something I want to take away from you, everybody read this out loud with me. Ready? Roses are red, violets are blue, you don't need blockchain when a database will do. <laughs> and I got one more thing. If you want to give somebody a gift that will last forever, you know, a diamond is one, but there's another one that I can recommend you give, and that is something that will live on forever. This is a Bitcoin Cash blockchain, and somebody set up this site which will take 
images or text and create transactions with the outputs. Those images and text encoded the outputs. So they're not valid transactions. Basically, you're throwing away your Bitcoin cash to get something permanently stored on the blockchain network forever. I submitted this transaction. You can see one input, which is my Bitcoin cash, lots and lots of outputs, encoding something. And let's go see what that is. This is that same transaction up here in the crypto graffiti.info, if you want to go to it. And this, what I'm about to show you, is on the Bitcoin Cash blockchain network forever. There. <laughs> so a perfect gift, a love note to a partner, spouse, family member, preserved forever on the blockchain network like this. So with that, I want to thank you very much. Hope to see you this afternoon at 2 o'clock. We'll have Vitalik Paterin from Ethereum. Have a great build.